Welcome, or welcome back. My name is Carol Steiker, and I'm a professor of criminal justice at Harvard Law School, and also a member of the committee that planned this conference. Uh, I welcome you to our afternoon session and the last panel discussion of the conference uh, on abolition. And I'm going to turn you over to the very competent hands of our panel chair, Professor Tommy Shelby, who is the Caldwell Titcomb Professor of African and African American Studies and of Philosophy and chair of the Department of African and African American Studies here at Harvard University. Thank you. Welcome, and Professor Shelby. Thanks so much, Carol, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, it is a great pleasure. Um, really quite a tremendous honor to be able, be able to participate in this conference on the life and legacy of Angela Davis. Um, I've been actually learning from Davis's work um, for a number of years now since I was a graduate student in the 90s. Uh, and, and indeed, last, just last fall, I taught two courses that featured her work, uh, a freshman seminar on autobiography and black freedom struggles, and a philosophy graduate seminar on philosophy and imprisonment. So I'm uh, enormously pleased to be able to uh, thank you publicly for your tremendous contributions to the struggle for freedom and justice and peace, um, both obviously in theory and in practice, for your powerful writings and for your personal example. It's been a, a great deal to me, um, particularly as a, uh, one of a small number of fellow black philosophers who, who look to you for, for inspiration, so thank you. So this afternoon's panel is on abolition. Um, Many now think that prison systems around the globe are in need of major reform. However, some, like Angela Davis, believe that we should not seek to reform prisons, but to end their use altogether. In books, in essays, in speeches, in interviews spanning now nearly 50 years, Davis has defended a world without prisons as a morally required and indeed a realistic political goal. Although this position is quite radical, strikes some as absurd, I myself have come to think that it is a position that merits quite serious consideration rather than dismissal. Prisons do great and sometimes irreparable harm, and this harm is not restricted to prisoners. If a society is to rely on them, this use, I think, demands quite compelling defense. Now, of course, philosophers have written quite extensively about uh, punishment and its justification. They devise theories based on retribution, on deterrence, on fairness, reconciliation, rehabilitation, moral education, many other things, anything you can dream of. <laughs> um, however, these theories typically abstract away from the concrete and grim realities of prison. These philosophical theories also usually assume that the societies within which imprisonment occurs, these societies are basically just. But what has to be shown, if it can be, is that imprisonment is a justified practice in our own unjust society and world, or at least that it would be justified in a world not too distant from our own. And what Davis does is raises quite serious doubts about whether this kind of justification is actually possible. Davis's critique of prisons is situated within a broader critique of racism, of sexism, imperialism, and capitalism. She has many objections to the practice of imprisonment. Just for example, she believes that it is dehumanizing, that it is a form and a legacy of slavery, and that it is an, it is an immoral alliance of crime control measures and the maximization of corporate profit, a prison industrial complex. She has argued that the function of the prison is, among other things, to facilitate economic exploitation, to perpetuate racism, to repress political resistance, and to conceal sometimes intractable social problems. Davis's anti-prison stance is best understood as a component of a broader revolutionary socialist vision. She believes that capitalist societies are oppressive and undemocratic, and an alternative social arrangement is possible and within our reach. In a truly just and democratic society, 
prisons, she insists, would be unnecessary. To help us better understand this radical vision and Davis's role in developing it, we have a quite an extraordinary set of panelists, which I'm sure you're all eager to hear from. Kathy Boudin, co-director and co-founder, Center for Justice at Columbia University. Ruth Wilson Gilmore is professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences and of American Studies and director of the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics at the Graduate Center at CUNY University, New York. Beth Ritchie is professor and department head of Criminology, Law, and Justice and professor of African American Studies and Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Now, unfortunately, Alicia Garza could not be with us this afternoon but um, I think our panelists will more than fill the space <laughs> and time. So each will speak for about 10 minutes or so, and then I'll moderate a brief discussion amongst the panelists, and then we'll take um, questions from the audience, and um, the panelists will uh, speak in the order in which they appear in the program, starting with Kathy, Kathy Boudin. Chris, thank you so much for inviting me here, and thank all of you for being here, and it's, uh, it's been tremendous learning and sharing experience, and I'm really glad that it's going to be able to be watched after this, because it's hard to absorb it all that we've seen. I'm gonna use this moment to repeat something that Angela always does when she speaks at our annual Beyond the Bars conference that the Center for Justice at Columbia does hold each year. Namely, she always comments that we are in the same small high school class for our junior and senior years of high school. <laughs> I always wish she wouldn't do it, so I'm doing it now. Um, <laughs> I get to do this now. Our, our relationship has gone from teenage slumber parties to a lifetime of certain experiences in common to trying to visit me in prison and being turned away to sharing some high school reunions to being an almost annual participant in our Center for Justice at where I work and now having the opportunity to say how honored I am to be able to talk about this journey that I have taken towards abolition. I first heard about the concept of abolition when I was in prison. By that time, I'd been in for about 20 years, 22 years, and a lot of lockdowns, cell searches, deaths from AIDS, life stories, in the parenting classes of young mothers who had lost their own mothers to the crack epidemic, lifelong friendships created in the cauldron of the prison yard. And I remember thinking, it's great that people are talking about building a movement to abolish prisons, but we need, to, we need toilet paper. Mm -hmm. You know, we need sanitary napkins. This was a beginning, although I wasn't really conscious about it then, about the relationship between abolition and reforms. Mm -hmm. The issue of the relationship between mm -hmm. abolition and reforms continues to come up for me around where do we put resources. Uh, the issue is often defined by a question. Are we focusing on making prisons better, or are we focused on getting rid of prisons? Mm -hmm. My question is, can we do both? I think we have to do both. Ruthie Gilmore, who has come to our annual Beyond the Bars conference, educating so many of us about abolition, often has been asked about reforms and has always said, of course, abolitionists support reforms. I know it is in the specific situations that the issues may arise. The toilet paper is a small example of it, but the need to always be aware of the fact that people are in prisons and jails still and creating a safe, and as humane conditions as possible for our loved ones is so important, even though it does include an ongoing investment. An example, we've been building a movement to reinstate the Pell Grant so that many people in prison have access to higher education. <clears throat> this often seems absurd to be putting resources into higher education in prison when people should be able to get this in the community. But there's no question in my mind that we have to struggle to put higher education in prison at this point because it's an amazing, what it does for people inside is so deeply important. This is just one example of recognizing that we may have to put money into improving prison conditions even though we want to get rid of the prisons. But the concept and vision of abolition, I think, still needs to be part of how we work on reforms and also how we analyze one reform or another. At some point when I came home after 2003, I heard about the book that Angela wrote, Are Prisons Obsolete? And I read it. I knew that prisons were terrible. I knew from sharing life stories with women with whom I lived when I read, this, read, read it, that if we were to deal with the problems that lead people to prison, addiction, poverty, abuse, of course, capitalism, um, we wouldn't have 
have people in prison. I, I agreed with that. It made sense to me. Uh, but linking this analysis to the idea of abolition of prisons was a, only a seed. It, 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 it was a seed placed, a beginning. The concept of actual abolition of prisons still did not seem very real to me. Still, I had that concept in me, and it, it impacted on conversations. I heard so many times both men and women say, prison saved me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From abuse, from drugs, from violence, from AIDS, from lack of education. So I began to say, when I heard that, isn't it sad comment on our society that people have to go to prison to avoid abuse, that they have to go to prison to get a college education, mm -hmm. you know? This dialogue with people became a starting point for conversations with people about abolition, although I don't think I even used that word at that time. As I slowly began speaking in different contexts about my time in Bedford Hills, the maximum security women's prison in New York, I initially would always begin about the amazing things that we, as a, as a, as a group of women in prison, did over a 20-year period. I mean, without the details, we took on the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s and 90s, taught ourselves parenting classes, and we created and fought to bring higher education back into the prison. It was a community of teaching, learning, and supporting each other, and changing the environment in the prison, and also creating models that other, other prisons could, could use. All of this led over decades to the creation of a community of women who have come home and are doing similar extraordinary work. And, you know, when I talk about this, I, I'm challenging the narrative about women in prison as uh, with their deficits, mm -hmm. you know, with their weaknesses, with their need to be rehabilitated. And I think that abolitionist was, you know, abolitionist thinking penetrated ab about this because now when I start, I never start by talking about the amazing things that we did inside. I start talking about how terrible prison is. It's, dis it's, it's destructive, it's degrading, it's a punitive environment in which people are locked in cages, always reminded that they are bad people. Mm -hmm. Defined by a number as if to strip them of their name. Your room, your cell is searched, you are told to stand outside, and you, you're the guard, you watch the guard as they throw the sheets on the ground and they empty the lockbox that has canned food, and they take your toothpaste and throw it on the ground and they throw your sheets. And then they stand and they say, okay, your cell's clear, you can come back now. And there's nothing you can say, and there's nothing you can do. And you develop a sense of humor that allows you to survive it. Mm. But it's only, in, so it's in despite of the punishment, and despite the inhumane conditions, that in the activities and programs and mentorship mainly developed by the men and women that are inside prison, that people emerge, fully grown leaders, and able to reimagine a life outside. So my journey of abolition included the inspiration of all the pe that people can do, can be, the enormous human capability that I experienced and still experienced, the enormous potential in communities outside that are defined still by their weaknesses and their deficits instead of seeing the larger social context as the weakness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the hardest aspects for me in thinking about the abolitionist vision is the framework that has been issued um, about how to deal with the harm done by people who use violence. Mm -hmm. Over and over again, I'm in conversations with people who are afraid to talk about, who are afraid to talk about people convicted of, of, of murder or of other violent acts. I, I mean, the, the national policymakers have, of course, not wanted to talk about it, and, and, and the movement has wanted to avoid it. And I think it's, it's really a problem, and I, I think that you know, people don't want to face the fact that some people in prison are there because they have been involved in the death of somebody, of harm done. And the movement has focuses on the nonviolent, the nonviolent of the good, the people in prison. But we know that's beginning to change a little bit. The statistics are out that more than half the people in prison are there for some kind of violent act. But uh, I think that, you know, it's, it's recognized inside prison that these long-termers or lifers, which is what we call ourselves, are actually the role models of people inside. Right. And they're the, they're the models and the inspiration that help younger people when they come in have some hope about what they're gonna do with their lives as many years as they have to have in prison. And you know, I, I would say, even when you ask a lot of men, they'll say, are you kidding? I don't wanna let that guy next to me out of prison. I, I would never have wanted to let everybody out of prison. So I think that we're, in a, we're grappling with the question of when we use the term abolition, how do we face the issue of harm that's done? Harm that's done in the future, or, and especially harm that's done right now. Um, 
I think that when I raised this with Angela one time, maybe three or four years ago, I think being in her traditional self, she was very open to saying, you know, there's other people that may have thought about this more than me, about what we do about this. She said, Let me talk, you should talk to my sister, Fania. And I think that's one of the strengths about Angela, is that she understands of sharing this process of developing what this abolition actually means. I think Angela has a courage of fearlessness about raising hard issues that abolition raises. Um, she's always kept the vision of, of abolition as a growing idea and able to ask hard questions. Um, you know, what should we do when people are killed by state violence? Or when women are abused, what should happen to their partner? Shouldn't they be put in prison? I remember Beyond the Bars conference happened as there was still a search for George Zimmerman, who had not yet been arrested after killing Trayvon Martin. The 1,000 people in the audience were on fire looking for George Zimmerman to pay for what he had done. In the Beyond the Bars conference, Angela asked, all of you are probably waiting for George Zimmerman to get caught, aren't you? Everybody's like nodding, you can hear it, and, and to be prosecuted. And she said, what, what will the arrest and prosecution and incarceration of George Zimmerman actually do? What's it gonna do to the system where what's what happened is gonna be repeated over and over again? And then she moved on, so, well, what about all the women that have been able to get the men that beat them in prison? Has that actually changed the culture that we're dealing with about the violence against women? What has it done? And the audience was just like, nobody knew what to say because she had challenged them and was able to ask those questions. I think that, you know, Angela has stayed firm on the vision of abolition while leaving the discussion open. What is another way? That the, I work with a group called RAP, Release Aging People in Prison in New York. We face the questions of what should accountability be? How can we end the punishment paradigm? How can we make public safety rooted in communities made safe by an investment in them? How do we build a strategy from work that's moving forward and looking realistically about dealing with, but also protecting people from harm, it understands the roots of violence and recognizes what a small proportion of people it is that actually are a tremendous threat. Angela Davis's approach is to firmly hold, hold the, the conception of that abolition, yet she knows that the process of working it out is part of the challenge that we need to work on. I think Angela has been a force of support for the critical role of people incarcerated and people who have been in prison, formerly and now, in building the movement for change and always supporting the growth and the voices of women who have been in prison. Formerly incarcerated people carry inside themselves a particular force for change through their courage to carry out the, the work and the dehumanization that the current carceral state places on them. Michelle Jones, who is here today, and who is a sister and colleague with us at the Center for Justice, was accepted by Harvard to the PhD program after 20 years in prison and was then ejected. And now in a PhD program in New York, she carries with her the inner strength and dignity. Sometimes it's the formerly incarcerated working as a group that Angela and Gina took time to spend. They took time to spend an evening with a group of women activists meeting in our Women Transcending Leadership Collective in, in New York recently to share movement history, knowing to connect the history to the present and supporting the role that this group of women who are all activists, who have all been in prison or directly impacted, are playing in a force for changing the system. The national, you know, I think, when I think about, I, I know my time is like nine seconds, and I think that, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna squeeze this in. You know, there are, there are forces of people who have come home from prison who are now part of an abolitionist movement. It never would have, I never would have believed three or four years ago where we're at now. I think that the National Council of Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, of which I'm a member, has its goal to end the incarceration of women and girls. That's the goal stated. They may not get funded by the big foundations to do that, but they're building. There was a conference about in Montgomery two weeks ago, almost three or 400 women and girls and their families and their men and their children were there. And this is the goal, this is an abolitionist goal. As one woman said, Fox Rich, and everyone called out with her, when we fight, we win. Mm -hmm. And now we see abolitionist activity among people in different cities actually closing down jails and closing down prisons. It's, it's Los Angeles, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, New York. The issues are complicated sometimes, but it's happening. And I think that you know, when you're in prison, it's hard to focus on anything but your immediate needs your immediate trials and tribulations, seeing your children, the harassment by the guards. You know, when will you get out? It's so important.
that Angela has held on to this vision of abolition and for that vision of abolition to keep empowering people who get shrunk into just self-survival and need to think about the longer range and for the people who are at home and doing things. So I just want to thank you and say the idea of abolition is no longer absurd. Thank you for making that real. a long way, sister. Yeah, we I'm glad we're here together. <laughs> yes. Back and forth and back and yes. forth and back yes. and forth, but always forward. Yeah. You know, it's not just side passes for those of you who follow not American football. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to, I want to make a, a general claim and then talk about abolition. So we are, individually and collectively, space time. That's what we are on this planet. And what prison is, is an incapacitation that it enables time to be extracted from the territory of the self. That is the main thing that prison does. It's not about convict leasing. It's not about private prison. It's just take, taking time. And that time coming out, out enables the circulation of resources for all different kinds of things. And that is the corruption of the social wage, which is to say ours our wage. So abolition is presence, not absence. It's a vision, but it's not a blueprint. Abolition then, I say, after 20 years of being shoulder to shoulder with my sister Angela Y. Davis in the struggle, abolition has got to be green. To be green, it's got to be red. To be red, it must be international. We see that criminal justice professionals from the United States fling themselves into airplanes and jet to Scandinavia to study the prisons there and then jet back to the United States to say, we have seen heaven. It is within the walls. We can do this. But they didn't really look at what they were looking at because if they had, they would have looked at the entire society. And without saying that Scandinavia has solved everything, because we know about the ongoing eruptions and struggles for migrant workers and other people, um, and the destruction even there of the welfare state, the fact that those lockups are small and as they are has to do with the whole society, not with some vision about what punishment should be. Abolition is, as, as everyone was saying on the, on the first two amazing panels today, is about the evolution of consciousness. So we've, we, we followed Angela's longtime friends and colleagues and lawyers and sister and comrades um, talking about the evolution of Angela Y. Davis's consciousness. And then in the feminisms panel, we followed different ways of seeing the evolution of feminist con consciousness, or as Barbara says, left anti-capitalist black feminist consciousness, um, and who it's for and what it's for. So abolition is the narrative of changing consciousness, of thinking what and thinking how, of thinking what and thinking how. And it constantly is in motion. Um, Cedric Robinson, five years ago, uh, one of the last things he did before he passed, uh, agreed to participate in a conference that I and some comrades, Jordan T. Camp and Christina Heatherton, organized at the Graduate Center at CUNY. And he insisted that Angela Y. Davis be on the panel because his teaching for us over his entire career was about consciousness, about consciousness and change, not about having the right answer and applying it, but out about constantly evolving our understanding toward the goal of making a world that is green and red and international. 50 years ago, 51 really, I met Fania. We were students together at Swarthmore College. And Fania and I and a small handful of students decided that we weren't going to take it anymore from the admissions office, Fred Hargadon, and we were going to take it over and make some non-negotiable demands. And in the context of, of that struggle, um, Angela came to town to give a lecture because her old professor from Brandeis, Dan Bennett, I think his name was, was teaching at Swarthmore, and he invited her to come. So Angela came and gave her lecture. 
And I was a first year student. I had no idea what was going on. I mean, I knew about the political part because I was raised in a political household. But you know, the idea of going to a lecture on philosophy didn't, I just didn't cross my mind. But I couldn't wait to have the political meeting with her afterward to talk about strategy for our struggle. And I should have gone to your lecture. I apologize. <laughs> We fought, we fought, we, we sat in, we did all of these things, and then there were two deaths, one right after another. The president of Swarthmore College died, and several days later, my cousin John Huggins was assassinated in Los Angeles. Um, John's mother and my mother's sisters. So one thing that I learned um, to do a, 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 a gloss on the thinking of my old dear friend and comrade and colleague, Alan Feldman, is that like murder, Arrest is the political art of individualizing disorder. The political art of individualizing disorder. So the murders of John and Bunchy and all of the other people who were murdered, the arrest eventually of, of Erica, uh, my cousin Erica, and other people in New Haven, of Angela, uh, individual, were all efforts to individualize disorder. Angela's arrest, of course, because I'm tall, and the color I am, prompted a series of stops and searches of me over the years, uh, over the, the time that Angela was, we were cheering her fugitivity. And uh, many years after that time, in the year 2000, Angela and I were walking down a street in Irvine, California, where we had gathered with Gina, Dent, and a few other people to, to try to bring abolition into a more um, theoretically uh, coherent framework. And an undergraduate who was showing some students around campus walked up to us, and she kept walking toward me with this big smile. And I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> and she got to me and said, Dr. Davis. I said, I'm not Dr. Davis. That is Dr. Davis. That child turned like I hadn't been there. She goes, oh, Dr. Davis. <laughs> But Dr. Davis, of course, being Angela Y. Davis, said, I want you to meet my colleague, Ruth Wilson Gilmore. All right. Some years ahead of, ahead of that encounter with that bright-eyed undergraduate, um, Angela came to Rutgers, where I was doing a PhD as a relatively old student. I was 44 years old at the time. Um, and uh, Angela came to give a talk. And two things that happened in our encounters there stayed with me from then until now. One, Angela talked about how she realized one day as she was leaving the San Francisco County Jail after having taught there, as she taught there for many, many years, that it didn't make any sense that she had keys to that place. It didn't make any sense. That was the one thing that she said. And I said, OK, this is something to think about persistently. The other was when she asked me what I was going to write my dissertation about, and I said, I'm going to write about prison expansion in California. I haven't figured it all out, but it all comes from work I've done with an organization of mostly women, most of whom are uh, black mothers of adults and children in the juvenile justice system. She said, whatever you do, don't write about crime. Don't write about crime. So. That then turned into, for me, in my research and writing and, and activism, what we came to call the prison industrial complex, which is to say, write about all of labor, not crime. Write about all of land, not crime. Write about all of capital and capitalism, not crime. And write also about our social ability to organize these factors land, labor, capital, and how they're disorganized. So that means you have to think about gender, race, citizenship, migration, urban, rural, industrial sector. You have to think about everything if you're not going to write about crime. So that was the best advice I ever got, and I'm grateful to you to this day. So the question then of what questions to ask uh, raises the issue of curriculum. And abolition is, in a sense, a self-perpetuating but always expanding curriculum, where we look at the world and we say, oh, what are those problems? And how can we understand undoing a world that resolves problems by displacing them to cages? And as Angela always says, not sending somebody to prison for punishment, but sending them to prison to be punished. 
right? How can we then understand whatever struggle we encounter in different ways? Um, having this sense of curriculum means that abolitionists have to be good at listening, listening closely. And we listened to Pirate Jenny last night with a beautiful, beautiful rendition. Thank you all for that. And Gina Dent reminded us this morning that that's a Bertolt Brecht lyric, Kurt Weill music. And then that also reminds me that in my earlier training, which was in drama, dramatic literature and criticism, surprise, surprise, my main guy was Bertolt Brecht and the alienation effect, and him teaching me to think about the world by watching people very closely and understanding their actions, not their emotions, their actions. And it's in paying close attention to action, as that song Pirate Jenny invites us to do, that we can think at the smallest detail, as well as the hugest detail, of how to do the work that we must do. The curriculum that abolitionists have tried to put into practice through the way that we organized, whom we organize, how we organize, how we encounter each other in conferences, in organizations, and movements, and constantly change, brings to mind some of the great historical uh, achievements of earlier revolutionary struggles, such as the education program of the PAIGC in Guinea-Bissau, Cabral, somebody who I believe Angela met, and others. And there's a new book out called, um, oh gosh, Education, Militant Education, Liberation, Struggle, Consciousness by a young Portuguese um, scholar called Sonia Vash Borges that's all about that curriculum, which is a curriculum in which we, we can undo the kinds of understandings of action and possibility and change um, that otherwise keep us narrow. In 1997, we got to, I'm going to go over two minutes too. In 19... <laughs> Reclaiming my time. <laughs> Feel free. In 1997, uh, at the, during the time that Critical Resistance Organizing Committee had started forming, um, and that Cassandra Shaler, who's here, and others had uh, put together the seeds of calling it Critical Resistance and thinking about what we were going to think about, Angela participated in back-to-back -back panels at American Studies Association. The first one was on the PIC, and she was on a panel with Eddie Ellis mm -hmm. and Jerry Miller and what's his name, Don Ziger? Harvest of, Harvest of Rage, is that who it was? All right, and Angela, nobody came. No, that room was empty. The very next panel was on the Blues book, which was about to launch, and, and, and Angela and Robin Kelly, that Robin, were on that panel in the room. People were hanging from the rafters, same room. First thing Angela Y. Davis did was say, where were y'all an hour ago? <laughs> As we organized Critical Resistance, um, uh, Angela had an accident, messed up her knee, so we had to take over her house to do our organizing. And uh, so we were all set up in the living room and in the office and so forth, and we were writing and rewriting the program, and Gina was like the, the head editor of, of the entire program and taking things out of people's hands and fixing the writing, and, and we were just like all, it was just, it was pretty intense. And at one point the doorbell rang, Larry Clark was at the door, and he said um, he needed to borrow, he was making a film and he needed to borrow a gun. And, and Angela said, you know, the last time I loaned somebody a gun. <laughs> Didn't turn out so well. I got in trouble. <laughs> But he did leave with the gun. <laughs> we were, as, 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 as Gina Dent told us this morning, planning for four or 500 people. But then we went to the Black Radical Congress in July in Chicago, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people arrived for that. And we rushed back to the Bay and said, we got to get ready, ready. And three, at least 3,500 people came. Now, of those 3,500, they kind of stand in for the 70 million or more people who either are documented not to work because they have some 
disqualifying arrest or conviction record, or they're not documented to work. Add them up, that is a bit more than half of the US labor force. This is who we're talking about. This is why abolition is a vision that must be green and red and international. The last thing I want to say, and I've used my two extra minutes, <laughs> is that as abolition has extended and encountered and revised and extended and encountered and revised, Beth is going to give us some insights into the question that Kathy raised about violence and harm. But I want to share with you that I met a young lawyer called Zara Ahmed, who has been doing work all over the planet uh, on the war on terror. And she sees from the ground up that we need the kind of uh, inspiration, vision, statement, and collaboration that Beth is going to share about to talk about the entire war on terror, not only the drone strikes and the reaction to drone strikes, but the entire war on terror, um, with her view uh, focusing especially on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. So abolition persists in connecting us. Angela Y. Davis, Davis was freed by the people, and we must continue the freedom of the people by the people into the future. Abolition now. <laughs> Abolition now. 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 <laughs> So um, I'll repeat the thank yous. Uh, I'll repeat how honored I am to be here. What a privilege. Um, just even right now on this panel with these two people, these three people, it's kind of an amazing moment. Um, I've been humbled. I've learned a lot. The panelists, the framers, the people who imagined that this was possible, um, all of you who came to reflect on the radical commitments of Angela Y. Davis, to all the people who are watching wherever you are, um, I'm glad to be here with you. I've been deeply moved by the rich stories that so many have shared. I feel like I got invited into this kind of um, quiet space of Angela's revolutionary heart. And I'm so grateful for those who spoke from the heart about um, about Angela's work. Um, I've been inspired by the magnitude of her legacy and those who have talked about the kind of huge moments of courage, the public, steadfast, radical commitments that have spanned uh, black liberation, Palestine, anti-capitalism, imperialism, the arts, human rights. The space for me feels like it has um, sort of overflowed, if you will, uh, with your greatness, Angela. I feel like it kind of rolls out the door and down the streets of Cambridge and across <laughs> the river, through the city, um, out of this state, like this great wave of greatness that has so impacted so many people in this country and around the world. It's almost like the space, the physical space, um, can't contain it. Um, and as the event comes to an end, I realize I'm the last panelist between you hearing from Angela Y. Davis herself. Um, as we come to the end of the panels, uh, I do feel a need to kind of pause and recognize what that greatness has been. And say that as we stand on stolen land, uh, and as we try to make sure that the revol revolutionary work that we've talked about, the left feminist women of color work that we've talked about, the abolition work, will reach not just those who can be here to witness or to listen, uh, but those who are still not free. People living in jails and prisons and cages, trying to survive the constant threat of violence in those spaces, in their homes, on the streets. And it feels to me like we have to find a way to reconcile the celebration of radical commitments, 
uh, that we've been talking about with such realness, with real work that we need to do. Work for justice and safety and work for freedom. So talking about work and then figuring out how to do work. And for me, the work of abolition comes right at the right moment when we pause and figure out what the real work in honor of the legacy and life of Angela Y. Davis could be. So after three panels, it's become obvious to me that what Angela Y. Davis has given us is a model of what it means to have lived these panels. Um, to be a revolutionary, to be a feminist, to be an abolitionist, all at the same time. As I was um, witnessing, uh, taking in, enjoying, laughing at, worried about the panels that came before me, I found myself wanting to play the drums and then <laughs> wanting to sing. Uh, I wanted to sneak up on the panel and just sit like as amen corner for the revolution. Um, and then I was up there watching the feminists. Like from up there, you see a whole nother view because you could see all of you. I was sitting up there feeling like, yeah, I'm, I'm down there with the uh, feminist panel. Um, it's really all about that when you talk about abolition. It's about arts and culture and music as freedom. That's abolition. It's about the stories that have been shared about organizing and writing from jail. That's abolition work. Traveling and teaching about freedom all across the world. That's abolition work. It's even abolition work to raise children in households where they grow up to be freedom fighters, like we heard last night. That's abolition work. For me, I feel um, grateful for being able to think about all the places that abolition work can happen and the ways that it has to take with it a spirit of revolution and feminist principles. So I'm gonna share my reflection on the life and legacy of Angela Y. Davis in the form of a thank you letter, a radical, revolutionary, urgent love letter to you from anti-violence activists who learn to be abolitionists because of your groundbreaking revolutionary left, thank you, Barbara, feminism. <laughs> Dear Angela Y. Davis, beloved friend, I speak for many in the radical anti-violence movement wherein we lift up your legacy with deep appreciation for the ways that our work has been transformed into an abolitionist praxis because of the influence of your revolutionary left feminism. Angela, you know that for more than 40 years, black and other women of color, queer and trans people have been organizing against gender-based violence in the context of other social movements we hope, including freedom from mass criminalization. That work has taken many forms over the years, most notably working to respond to those among us who have been harmed, deeply harmed, and simultaneously doing the political work that puts the issue of gender freedom at the center of other mobilizing efforts, like the work for black liberation. As you know, Angela, that work has been met with considerable resistance. First, we have struggled against a kind of tyranny of mainstream, liberal, glass-ceiling, white feminism. Those who insist on continuing to rely on the carceral state for remedy for gender-based violence in the form of law enforcement, surveillance, legislation, call-out culture, etc. Second, you know we have found ourselves in oppositional positions with some black liberation formations who have attempted to silence our work, erase our demands, focusing instead on the most ex uh, exclusive focus on the crisis facing black cisgender men, who the state defines as men, ignoring other forms of gender oppression, like violence, inserting patriarchal solutions that trivialize gender violence, undermine the leadership of women and queer people, creating what I call a trap of loyalty that causes further harm. Mm -hmm. Gender essentialism on the one hand, 
a master race narrative on the other. That's the bridge that's called our back, isn't it, Angela? Mm -hmm. It leaves us with no selves to defend. Mm -hmm. It's the question of intersectionality, the challenge of carceral feminism, a black patriarchal of the need to say our name, and a sense that we aren't safe until she is safe. Now here I'm calling out the slogans of black and other women of color, feminist responses, queer organizing, campaigns that ensure that the mobilization against gender violence is embedded in the work to end state violence so that when we respond to the degradation of rape and partner battering and sexual harassment and forced sex work and forced sterilization and forced abortion, we understand from your revolutionary work, Angela, that these harms are linked to the disappearance and murder of trans people, of police excessive use of force, of sexual coercion by state authority, of torture that happens inside jails and prisons and hospitals and police precincts and patrol cars. We know that these violences, because of your work, are expressions of the mean-spirited carceral state that system of capitalism, of heteropatriarchy, of anti-black racism, settler colonialism, persistent poverty, failing educational systems, Chicago teachers are on strike, lack of health and mental health services. Your work, Angela, as an abolitionist, helps us remember that, we are, that when we are doing anti-violence work, we have to do it understanding that we live within a prison nation a place where criminalization has become the first political instinct to arrest, detain, charge, sentence, incarcerate, then surveil people as a way to end violence. The carceral state is violence, and it won't solve violence. Indeed, many people who have survived violence are actually captured in those actual places where we have designed to put people, theoretically, to punish them by the carceral state especially black people, queer people, disabled people, immigrant people, young people, violated people. Yes, Angela, your abolitionist praxis has given us voice so that we can connect gender violence to state violence to mass criminalization and other systems of institutionalized oppression and looking forward to thinking, Ruthie, where else we can make those connections. This isn't a theoretical discussion Angela, as you know, this is life-saving work that you have helped us do better. It's more than a set of theoretical connections. Abolition praxis compels us to bring all of the sources of danger into urgent view and to respond to those in the ever-expanding curriculum, Ruthie, around social justice. So that our activism can move beyond uh, our narrow analysis of services uh, our work can move beyond an archive and an exhibit, beyond discussions to those places of danger where people really live, literally trying to save their own lives. And as we do that, we are compelled to think about how, in fact, that might us help us save the souls of our movement. Mm -hmm. I say that because, indeed, prisons are destroying our anti-violence work not providing remedy to those who are most affected by it. Brings me to the second part of the love letter. Um, uh, and you know, since this is an archive after all, I'm assuming that there's room for a little longer letter <laughs> in some of the work that has happened here. So I'll take a few more minutes. Uh, so this, dear Angela, is the second part of the letter where beyond the work that you've done to provide us a way to critique the carceral state as a way to solve the problem of violence, this is a place where we can appreciate what you've taught us as anti-violence activists about how to respond in abolition praxis instead. You've taught us that we must take seriously the harm that gender violence causes to individuals, to families, and to our movement and organizations. I will never forget the moment at the Critical Resistance Conference where you said that out loud to those thousands of people who were in the room. And it felt like for those of us who had been doing the work for so long, like breath had been filled into our, our lungs, actually, and our ability to give voice to use our voices toward this work. 
You've taught us that responses to harm demand a different kind of first reaction, one that doesn't build up the prison nation, but actually sets people free. You've taught us that instead of using prisons, using police, using law enforcement, we have to pay attention to root causes of violence, like economic inequality, heteropatriarchy, anti-black racism, and that we need to think about care, like jobs and schools and how communities can care for themselves. We have to be led by those who are most impacted. And you've taught us that we need to have a much broader set of things that we work on. In my world, it means working beyond mandatory arrest, beyond sex offender registries, beyond new surveillance technology, beyond Title IX, beyond Me Too, beyond Time's Up, even beyond um, showing up and fighting for guilty verdicts for men who use violence, including police officers. We need to fight for a different kind of society. Mm -hmm. Angela, you taught us that prisons are obsolete. We know they don't make sense because they don't work. Um, they don't work to end the most beautiful for, form, the most brutal forms of violence at all. Instead, you've taught us to demand uh, that we respond to harm in ways that people who experience want us to, that we listen to survivors, that we create systems of accountability. We consider reparations that might help us build communities. We expand opportunities. You've taught us that insight matters, that Project NIA, Love and Protect, the Black Women's Blueprint, CARA, National Network for Women in Prison, BYP 100. Over time, you've taught us that step by step, person by person, organization by organization, we have to get ready to fight for freedom. As black and other women of color and queer activists, Angela Davis, we thank you for critical resistance. We thank you for the work that it did that allowed us to start Insight following in the wake of that. We thank you for uh, allowing us to dream bigger and do our work better. Um, we have new theories, we have new analysis, we have new framework, but most of all, we have better politics. I know that from talking with my anti-violence activist friends. I know that from talking with my students at Stateville Prison and at UIC. I know that from talking with my daughter and from the women and gender queer people who are locked up as survivors. You've taught us that through your example of the rich and radical life that you've led, a courageous life, that survival is possible, but even more than that, we will prevail when we fight for freedom. Abolition is part of that freedom fight. It's beyond survival. It's a freedom fight. And so in closing, Angela and Gina, when you get home, pull out another box. <laughs> put this letter inside. <laughs> and as you continue to build an archive of the work that is yet to be done, the aspirational work, the abolition work, label the box, how I helped a movement move from carceral feminism to the liberatory possibility that comes with abolition. How I helped a movement move from carceral feminism to the liberatory possibility that comes with abolition. And when you look at that box, pause for a moment and consider the lives that you have quite literally saved and the movements that have been organized around them. For that, we are deeply, deeply appreciative. And we sign the letter with radical, revolutionary, raging, feminist, left feminist, abolitionist love. <laughs>discussion to follow up on, on the, these initial remarks and then we'll turn to the to the audience we'll be thinking of your your questions for the panelists so I thought maybe I would try to channel some of the the questions I get from students and from and, and teaching around abolition the kind of questions I ask and I'm sure some people in the audience might be curious you anticipated some of the things I might have, might have asked but there are other things um, so here's here's one thought for, for, for anyone who want, wants to speak to it um, so, uh, may surprise some people, um, but I actually, my dissertation was actually on Marxism. Um, but uh, one of the things you find, uh, <laughs> but one of the things you, you, you um, 
uh, fine in Marx, right, is uh, I always say, you know, well, Marx doesn't invent the socialist tradition, obviously. He comes along, he has a particular brand of it, also called a scientific socialism, rooted in historical materialism. But it, um, but he was very critical of what he called utopian socialist, mm -hmm. right? Um, and indeed, even from the beginning toward the end, even Engels writes, you know, um, socialism utopian and scientific to, to critique the utopian socialist. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've heard many times questions from people who are not Marxists or not influenced by our tradition and say, well, isn't this utopian? Don't you have a utopian conception of human nature and so on? But I mean, you can imagine the, the, the same line of question coming from someone in the, the Marxist tradition or in the broader socialist tradition. And I wonder what you might say in response to those who, who think, well, it, it seems like maybe in the background there's a conception of human nature that the causes of unjust aggression against others are always rooted in social injustice as opposed to springing from other motives that might be a part of, kind of the kinds of flawed beings that we are. What might you say to that sort of, that sort of question? Anyone who might want to speak to it? Yeah, I'd love to speak to it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might. <laughs> That's a really good question. Yeah. If it were true that the kinds of um, uh, violent and undignified ways, uh, actions that we um, do to each other were just some aspect of our species being, it would be the same everywhere, and it's not. That's the first thing I want to say. I'm, I, I just don't, don't accept that. That said, I'm not trained in philosophy, so I might have already gone like way out of my lane by saying species being. <laughs> <laughs> The second thing I want to say that's more <laughs> But the second thing I want to say that is back in my lane is that all of the work that the three of us are talking about up here, that um, everybody shared on the feminisms panel and that everybody shared last night, um, uh, that everything we've been talking about is all from the ground up. So it is work that tells us, and then the revolution panel, how could I slip that, let that slip? All of it is work that people already do. So there's not a kind of an idealist utopianism that is floating over the world, um, hoping to drop its form onto the social at all. Rather, what abolitionists try to do, what the communists did in Alabama that Robin has written about, what the PAIGC did in Guinea-Bissau that many people have written about, and so on and so forth, is to see what people already do, what Harriet Tubman did, see what people already do, see how they understand themselves, and then do with people the kind of reflective, moving work to change actions from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, that's, what, that's what abolition is. It's not, ab it's not idealist at all. So Du Bois talks about it in Black Reconstruction in America. You can see examples during the first intifada in Palestine when I was there. There were people in the West Bank and Gaza building these alternative worlds already. That got crushed, but they were there. They were there. It was, there was nothing idealist about it or utopian. Mm -hmm. But it was better. Right. It's also um, what Kathy Boudin did with ACE at Bedford Hills Prison. So there's a very important, I think, starting place to look at the organizing, the resistance, the teaching, the sharing of resources, the protection, the love, the analysis that happens on the inside, far from a utopian situation that happens on the ground every day on the inside, inside of prisons and jails and detention centers and with people who are under house arrest, that's really about abolition praxis. And I think as we think about where abolition is living, you know, real, where it's alive, where it's happening, where we can look to examples, I want to make sure that that includes inside those places that are sometimes, for some people, the hardest to imagine. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Life-saving work. I also think that if we're looking at 
<clears throat> abolition in terms of not needing prisons. I think you have to root it. I do think you have to root it in the, in the realities of, of capitalism. Right. I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in reality of the structure of social, economic, and political inequality, race, mm -hmm. gender, all of it penetrates it. And I don't think that we can separate it from that. I think that, I, I always say it seems so easy. If you look at the communities that are made safe and don't mainly have anybody in prison, they're made safe because they have housing, they have decent education, they have, they have jobs for teenagers, they have jobs for adults, they're treated with respect. And the issue of prisons is not relevant or the police primarily to making those communities safe. And you look at communities of people of color, of poor people, and how you make those communities safe is to have those prisons, to have the school to prison pipeline, to have the police. And so we have a completely different standard. And I think that that standard, different standard, can inform us when we think about what's possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are, there are a number of students who are involved in uh, ongoing campaign to divest from um, um, prison-related industries, and I'm sort of curious if, um, if you have any of you have thoughts about the role that might play in uh, in an abolitionist vision, um, whether that is, as Ruthie already pointed out, there's an evolution in consciousness. So, <laughs> so um, where does th that kind of campaign around private prisons or the investment in prison-related industries? How does that figure in a broader abolitionist vision? Or does it? This is my hobby horse. It is. <laughs> Go. Everyone should fight how they need to fight, but plan to win. So let us say the divestment committee gets Harvard to divest from Core Civic tonight. What changes for anybody in a cage tomorrow morning? Nothing. Nothing. If every private prison contract were canceled tonight, how many people do you think would go home late at night hoping that their Angela and their um, brother-in-law, Evan, were waiting there with their baby? None. None. So plan to win. So if that's the fight, figure out what the effect of waging that fight would be. That said, a multi, 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 multi billion dollar empire like Harvard which has greater wealth than the sovereign wealth of probably most of the countries on this planet, could use its economic clout to compel banks that issue bonds to municipalities and states to build prisons not to do that business. If Harvard said, we won't do business with any bank that will write a bond to build any prison, whether public or not, that would be meaningful because then the municipalities couldn't build them. In terms of evolution, I know that people of goodwill who are serious about revolution get into the groove of thinking that stopping private prisons is a way on the path. I invite you not only to think about what, would be, what it would be like the next morning, but also to think really hard about why it is that over the past 30 years, round after round after round of this kind of organizing hasn't produced the kind of change in consciousness that it could. And then think, if this is what your campaign is, how to do that consciousness building work. Again, fight where you're fighting, but think about what happens the next morning. So I was, at, I was at Columbia when uh, the students there, Students Against Mass Incarceration, decided to do, I think, what was probably maybe the first, or one of the first in disinvestment campaigns against private prisons. And um, Barbara Ramsey's daughter was like one, the leader of that, actually, or one of the leaders of it. And I think the way that I thought about it was I, I knew at the time that private prisons are, you know, at most 11% if that much, of, of the numbers of prisons. In, they're, they're mainly, it's a, it's a public, it, you know, prisons are public. Uh, immigration centers are a different issue, but I think that part of the thing that I saw happening was for the first time, 
people on the campus in a large way were thinking about prisons. And so when I knew that Ruthie was, was thinking, wait a minute, you know, what are private prisons? You know, it's, it's, I thought, like, on the one hand, I felt like this was a step forward because the, the people who were organizing this campaign, they had prison cells in the middle of the campus. People were thinking about prison in a more widespread way than anything else that they had done before. So I thought, I think what you're saying that you have to think about how do you talk about what you're doing if it's a partial thing, it seems very partial, in a way that has a broader view to it? And I don't remember you know, how much their literature and what they were talking about in general. I saw a mobilization of students thinking about prisons, and I thought that that was a really important step. I don't know. So I'll add something that, you know, these are more questions. I, I really appreciate this discussion. Um, one is, I think, um, embedded in the question about what campaigns to engage in is a question about a long-term strategy. And I think often our campaigns, and, and I think long-term, abolition is long-term strategy. And I think campaigns that are more short-term need to be <coughs> evaluated against a set of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's not a direct answer, but I do think sometimes we haven't evaluated what the unintended consequences of short-term campaigns would be that end up to work against a long-term commitment to abolition. Mm -hmm. I also think that the notion of divestment is an important one. Um, and I think certainly activism around divest, invest is important. And the part of that that's important is the invest part. Well, as important is the invest part. And so if we think about divestment from, you can fill in the blank, and we measure the campaign against what are potential unintended consequences, and if we, as Kathy said, use it among other things, as an opportunity to build mass mobilization, to change public opinion, to raise consciousness, to engage more people, to link issues, build coalition. If we think about that as part of what the work is, we have to also think about investment. Mm -hmm. um, we can't only divest our way out of the problem, the project of mass criminalization. We have to figure out the investment part. That's what abolition offers us, I think. I'm sure the students are provoked and they will come to and ask questions. Um, so here's, here's another a question about the scope of, 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 ab, of ab, abolition. I think it will be, so, I mean, it might help, help me and others think about what's most objectionable about incarceration by thinking about the scope. So, so you could imagine abolition extending to uh, policing, to electronic surveillance, you could even imagine it extending to um, involuntary, involuntary commitment of people to psychiatric hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, so I want, so I, I want to like to get your reflections on how you conceive of the scope of like what's included in the things that you imagine that ultimately want to, to end or not rely on. Um, and, and, but connect that, if you can, to uh, what it is about those, those, those things, if, if all, say, all four of those things, prisons, psychiatric hospitals, police, and surveillance, what is it about those things? What do they have in common? Maybe, and maybe it's not something they have in common that's objectionable such that they become a part of the broader vision of what needs to be done away with. I think it might help people to kind of have a sense of, 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 of what the opposition is to when one's thinking about prisons. Is that clear? Is the question clear? The question is clear, and I'm not altogether sure that's the question I want to answer. But <laughs> you asked it, <laughs> Professor Shelby, I will do my best. <laughs> and the reason I'm not sure that's the question I want to answer is you've gone back to prisons and, and that particular form, those carceral and freedom instances, all of which are crucial. And it seems like all the rest of the social order dropped out again. Yeah. When I don't you're mean trying to, to keep it. together. Okay, I all right, all right, good, good. 
I should say it's very good. Lane now. I, <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> I assume, to make it clear, I assume that there are pl plenty of radical reformers, I take it, that would have it as part of the vision to transform, I mean, people who don't think of themselves as abolitionists, who mm -hmm. also would like to see a radical transformation in our social order, mm -hmm. um, maybe even a socialist direction. Um, but they might not themselves be, be abolitionists when they wonder, well, why? So how, what is it about prisons and prison-related mm -hmm. or things that look like prisons that's so objectionable that we should imagine that is also a part of okay. our efforts to transform things? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I mean, I, there were like a million things that came to my mind. One is state abuse of power. One is feeding a system that violates human rights. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's the sort of specificity that you're looking for, but I almost, and I, I don't mean this to be um, flippant or sarcastic, there's nothing that I would, that I've heard in the years that I've um, been going into prisons or identified as an abolitionist <coughs> excuse me, that would suggest we, we would want to keep any part of them. Right. There just isn't. I mean, <coughs> excuse me, I haven't seen them work to do anything except take my voice away when I talk about <laughs> it. All right, I'll come back. Uh, um, could, I, there, yeah, could, I, there, could I pick up there? Or Kathy, <coughs> am, I, am I cutting? No, I'm going to wait. No. Okay. Um, so maybe one way to, to respond to what you, you, you asked Professor Shelby, may I call you Tommy? Of course. <laughs> Please call me Ruthie. Is, um, is to think about the centrality of organized violence in the context of the racial capitalist social order. And racial capitalism is all of it, all of it, all of it, all of it. And that the forces of organized violence, which include electronic monitoring, include civil injunctions like gang injunction zones, as well as um, uh, involuntary commitment, and so on and so forth, are, go hand in hand with the organized abandonment right. that are constant return to the impossibility of reforming capitalism as it's constantly saving itself from itself presents to us. So it's the trying to put organized violence together with organized abandonment that gives us some insights into, for example, as I was saying toward the end of my remarks, the um, importance, the urgency of putting together uh, in, with some clarity in uh, constant debate and conversation with our comrades around the world an understanding of how to think about and therefore fight against the war on terror, but also to understand that so many people who are displaced who wind up in immigrant detention, for example, in the United States and elsewhere, if they even live on their journeys to wind up in detention, are people displaced pretty much by climate change and war. Climate change and war. And this is why abolition has to be green and red and international, because of climate change and war. That's what I was trying to say. Oh. <laughs> 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 I don't have to talk now. <laughs> uh, you can skip me. It's all right. Did you, did you want to? No. <laughs> so I think it would be good to hear some questions from the audience. So as before, I'm the, the, the microphone is right here in the center. Uh, please try to keep your questions Thank you. brief. Uh, try not to repeat questions that already been asked or, or asked questions that have already yes. been answered. <laughs> um, and please uh, identify yourself if you don't mind, because we're um, filming. Is this on? It is indeed. Okay. Well, I'm Carol from New Jersey. <laughs> okay. Hi, Carol. Hi, Carol. <laughs> and, and, and basically, oh, thank you. what has concerned me about this conversation about incarceration is that there really has been, in my mind, a real lack of discussion about the imprisonment of people of color in this country and how race has played such a fundamental role in this incarceration. So I'd like to see here what the panel really just really deal with 
that issue mm -hmm. and uh, what we can do about that. Thank you. We're going to take all of should Let's we take, take all the questions. Yeah. No. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to the panelists for speaking. Uh, my name is Zoe Hopkins. I'm a sophomore uh, here at Harvard College. Um, I'm also an organizer with No New Jails New York City. Um, for context, some of you in this room may know New York City just decided to spend $11 billion uh, building four new jails. Um, they are masking this um, under the guise of closing Rikers Island. Um, there was nothing in the plan that they um, came up with uh, that mentioned closing Rikers Island. Um, uh, something that we came up against in the struggle against the building of these jails um, are actually people who claim the mantle of abolition, um, but then said that they wanted to build four new jails. Um, and I think that this is related to, I'm just gonna, I think that this is related. <laughs> this is related to um, a larger puzzle um, in conversations around abolition, which is sort of the tension between like long-term vision and the urgency of the issue, right? Like I am asking for abolition now, as as you all are, and I know that there are concrete steps for abolition now, um, as embodied in movements like No New Jails. Um, so I'm wondering. First of all, what, what would you say to people who um, call themselves abolition but who want to build new jails? And then also, how would you respond to the tension between abolition as a long-term vision and abolition as something that is about life and death, that is urgent, that needs to be accomplished as immediately as possible? That's my question. <laughs> Maybe we'll just, just take those two and get, get a few, okay. few answers, and then we'll come back. All right. Oh, do you want to see? No. Um, where'd Carol go? Oh, Carol. Carol from New Jersey. Carol from New Jersey. Um, Carol Campbell. Yeah, hi, Carol. Um, so uh, it is very clear. I, I think it's very, it's very clear to me that mass criminalization beyond mass incarceration, mass criminalization is a racialized project. It's, it's very clear. I mean, it, it takes one step inside a jail, prison, detention facility that it is a racialized project. In the years that I've taught at Stateville Prison, I've had one non-black male student. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been that many years, but if I continued for the rest of my career teaching, that that's what the situation would be. Out of just out of proportion, um, in any urban area, in any urban area, in any um, state facility, in any <coughs> federal prison, black and other people of color are overrepresented. It is a racialized project. There is no doubt. And um, it is interesting that you reflected, and I, I sort of hold myself accountable to not saying that clearly. You know, sometimes it's like, I know you all know this, but <laughs> we could go down the line about the number of people, why they're there, what communities they come from. In Chicago, if we put up a map of the five communities that have experienced most abandonment, Ruthie, right? Most abandonment, the five, those are the five places where people come from in the jail and in the prisons. Mm -hmm. And they aren't the places that have the highest crime rate. They're the places that are targeted for the racialized project of mass criminalization. And that's true no matter where we were. And it's the places with the highest rate of asthma and the highest foreclosure rate mm -hmm. and the worst public transportation and so-called food deserts. And those are the schools where the leadership is on strike in the cities of Chicago. And those are the places where people are unemployed. You know, so it's, the, it's a perfect alignment around the questions of disadvantaged divestment and institutionalized racism as well as all of the other issues that feed into the buildup of mass criminalization. Mm -hmm. so, I, I'm sorry. so I guess in terms of dealing with the, mic, oh, with the dialogue about how we deal with this institutionalization of the imprisonment and the, and the destruction of people of color in this country. When we talk about that, and, and I guess these are the issues when we talk about what is it that we're doing? 
because these young black men and these young black women are dying. Absolutely. And, and, and when we need to address it headlong, and I guess my frustration is that, yes, I was not hearing that. And what are the strategies that we can be able to do to eliminate that? Mm -hmm. I want to say, Sister Carol from New Jersey, um, that if you are at all interested, uh, we and others have um, shared a lot of work that is directly addresses the issues that you raised, um, that is available on YouTube and other places. So I'm not being flippant. It was, it's, you know, we came here together to do something and we couldn't do everything, but I totally feel what you're saying. And our work has gone exactly in that direction because the thing that we're fighting against Every second is how I define racism, which is group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Yes, that's what we are doing. Yes. I'll just say, I think that it's, it is striking that none of us talked about it. And I think there was sort of an assumption, in a sense, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. that was an understanding a basis from what we're coming from. I think that in, I, I just know that in all the work that all of us do, the issue of talking about race the connection to slavery, the racism, the communities, and in a sense what I was trying to say when I said some communities are made safe because they have schools and they have uh, uh, jobs and they have self, they have respect, you know, they're treated with respect, and other communities, mainly communities of color, are not treated that way. And I think that race and racism underlies, I mean, we know from the statistics of who gets arrested for using drugs, for example. We know that black young people were, were, were called super predators. We understand how that happened. And I think that, from my point of view, the only reason I can imagine we didn't talk about it is because there was kind of this assumption about mm -hmm. what we believed. Yeah. Yeah. But I think you're absolutely right to have raised it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And thank you. Wouldn't would you like to speak to the question of building new jails, the campaign against oh, building yeah. new jails? No new jails, no new jails. Um, we might disagree about this. Um, so, there's, you know, there's nothing we can do about people appropriating terms, names, shininess for their own ends. Um, so I call them phobolitionists. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, just you might be able to say that from time to time. That said, in, in the New York case, uh, the problem is that in a uh, uh, alleged um, movement to close the horror that is Rikers Island, which is a whole bunch of jails. On that island, all the city has done is plan to build, as Zoe said, uh, $11 billion of new jails. The buildings are not going to solve the problems. People pretend that things fix relationships between people. It's the relationships between people that lead Rikers to be a murderous rape place. It's nasty too, and they should fix the draining. And then close it and close it and close it. And close it and close it and close it. Not build a new one. I think there's also a, a really important, this is the unintended consequences discussion I alluded to before. Um, I lived in New York City for a long time and I spent time at Rikers Island and that sort of answers the previous question in some ways about why would we ever argue to not close Rikers Island? I mean, unless we were deeply committed to the death, which is, I think, obviously what some people are committed to because they argue to not close Rikers Island. Mm -hmm. um, we can't reform our way out of the premature death, so that's, I think, one part. But also, I think we need to refine our definition of abolition and understand that decarceration is different than abolition. Mm -hmm. And the way, because we are so committed to carcerality and criminalization in our society, we could, we could it's possible to imagine that we will decarcerate people and they will continue to be under the kind of mean-spirited, life-taking surveillance of the carceral state. <laughs> 
because they're wearing electronic monitors or have to pay for their pr uh, probation or are under house arrest or whatever else people might come up with. And they will come up with something else until we dismantle the system, not just close the jail. So it, I, I think broadening the discussion of, or clarifying the discussion about abolition and decarceration is worthy of some of our um, activist time. Should we take two more questions and then? Okay, hello, um, my name is Jackie. I'm a PhD student here at Harvard and a Radcliffe Fellow as well, um, writing a dissertation on prisons and the history of prisons in mostly the 60s and the 70s. So there's, I just wanted to start off by saying a couple of things about the Harvard Prison Divestment Campaign, which has been deeply, deeply informed by Ruthie Gilmore's work. And because um, people who have been organizing this campaign have been so engaged with Ruthie's work in particular, it hasn't focused exclusively on private prisons, there's this more capacious understanding of the political economy of prisons and even the role of banks in underwriting bonds. Um, and so, and investment has been a component of the campaign as well. But I think the question of whether it's, uh, the strategy is the most useful is still a question that's on the table. Um, but I wanted to return to this question of the relationship between abolition and reform. Uh, which is, it relates to Zoe's question as well. And um, I'm thinking about a quote from Angela Davis that's something to the effect of, the history of the prison as an institution is a history of reform. And I think that this is slowly getting more and more lodged in my brain as I study the history of prisons and particularly the reform moment in the 60s and 70s. Because when we think about the creation of the modern penitentiary, we think about the late 18th century and the early 19th century and Quaker penal reformers that thought, you know, um, putting people in prison was a, a way to reform the souls of people. Um, but there's another reform moment, which is what I'm writing about um, in my dissertation, uh, where there is a question of whether or not um, more or better prisons should be constructed during this period. And I'm looking at debates around the national um, campaign for a moratorium on prison construction in the 1970s and how there was a, um, a group of reformers that were essentially technocratic reformers who thought that through um, design and architecture that you could build more humane prisons and that that would solve the problem. And reformers were re very actively cons conscripted by the state to legitimize a system that was in crisis. And it's something that seems to happen over and over and over again throughout history or wherever um, you know, whenever the criminal legal system is challenged, that the, the way that the state co-ops um, reform is by... Jack, Jack I've got, got, got to cut you off because we're okay, basically yeah. out of so time. I was just going <laughs> to ask about how do you um, balance the, uh, the urgency of the present? Um, and, and I really appreciated um, the way that Kathy introduced the topic. And how do you balance those concerns um, with keeping your eye on abolition and not kind of being a part of legitimizing the apparatus through the process of, of non-reformist reform. Thank you. First of all, I think you have to look at the moment in history and look at the particular context in order to figure out exactly how you work within that. I think right now, there is a real action push to not build new prisons and not build new jails. And I think that it means that at this moment, keeping that in the forefront really matters. It doesn't mean that you don't try to make conditions better in any given situation. I feel like work that we do in New York, for example, is reformist to try to get uh, elderly people who have been convicted of violent crimes out of prison. That's, that's reformist, completely. Because people are dying. We call death by incarceration at this point is happening. 
because of the length of sentences. That's a reform. But at the same time, we always keep in mind the fact that we have to talk about what is the system that has created this. Mm -hmm. So I think that really, if you're somebody that's keeping in mind the, the vision of no new jails, no new prisons, you have to figure out at any given situation what is necessary to do in terms of reform that may be right in front of you. And I think you have to do both. Mm -hmm. And if I can just add, I think the same people have to do both. Yeah. And I, the reason I'm thinking about that is I know in my work around ending gender-based violence that to talk to people about the long-term strategies of social change and social justice when someone is immediately being hurt <clears throat> is, won't work unless we deal, find ways to deal with immediate harm and at the same time, find ways to create the kind of radical social change that will allow for the ending of gender-based violence. And I think there's an analogy yeah. around, um, around abolition and reform. And the reason I say the same people should do both is I think what happens if we don't require that of each of us, we start to feel like our, the object of our criticism is like the abolitionist when I'm the reformer, or the reformer when I'm the abolitionist, and said, instead of saying, within our organizations and within our own activist strategies, we have to pay attention to individual needs for safety and um, protection, and we need to also be engaged in creating social change. Mm -hmm. With sincere apologies to those waiting in line. We're actually over time, um, and um, so we're, what we're gonna do is take a, a really brief break and uh, this 15 minute break to come back for the keynote conversation. So please thank the panel for this quite stimulating discussion. Thank you so much, Tommy, Kathy, Ruthie, and Beth for that powerful discussion. We ask, we are completely at capacity and um, if you leave the building, you will not be able to get back in. So we ask that you stay at your seats. If, there are, if there's room in between um, you and your neighbor, please um, get nice and cozy as we just wait this last 15 minutes out before our closing keynote presentation.